Well, how has your weekend gone so far? Consider just the last couple of days. How's it been? It's a completely loaded question, by the way. How will you judge the last few days? Will you think about what you got? Or will you think about what you gave? Will you consider the fun you had? Or will you consider the opportunities you had to help someone else? Will you think in terms of things that made you happy? Or that you were able to make someone else happy? And will Jesus be in that consideration? His word that you read. His presence that you knew and felt his comfort even his challenge or his rebuke my question is is the Lord Jesus Christ real in your everyday life and maybe you're thinking steady on Robert don't start this sermon by beating us up so badly things are hard you don't know everything that I'm going through I'm in need of comfort this morning and not a rebuke well, we'll soon see that our scripture text, it's, it's all comfort this morning. It's, it's all of that. And joy, and forgiveness, and peace. But it all rests upon Jesus being real. And for us as his disciples this morning, the reality of our Savior is not only an objective fact, and it is. He rose from the dead. He is alive forevermore. But it's also subjective. Because we know him through faith. Listen to the Apostle Peter, 1 Peter 1, verses 6 to 9. In this you greatly rejoice, who now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Yeah, we don't see Jesus, but joy and glory and salvation come through believing in the reality of the risen saviour. Uh, Luke in this final chapter of his gospel account. Gives us clear eyewitness evidence. Of the physical resurrection of Jesus. As we saw before the disciples there. They're lacking in faith. Jesus had told them several times. He would rise on the third day. It is now the third day. And they're so slow to believe. The women they come back. Excited from the empty tomb. Having seen the angels. And the angels have told them. Christ is risen. Their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. And it's into that that Christ now appears. He appears. That the, two, the two disciples have just come back from um, Emmaus. They're, they're in the room. They're starting to tell them, we've seen Jesus. And then comes Jesus himself. Peace be unto you. And the disciples are terrified. They are frightened. Again, they're just not expecting to see Jesus alive again. Why? Well, we don't see that, do we? What's more, Jesus has just appeared in the room. There's no knock. In John's account, John 20, verse 19, we read, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And what Jesus does is he, he ensures his disciples about the reality of his resurrection. Not only does he appear, he also speaks. He asks them to not only look uh, and see him, but feel him, to reach out and handle him. And then he, he, he eats in their presence to knock that idea out of their heads that they've just seen a ghost. 
And the effect of all of this upon the disciples is wonderful because they go from terror and fright to this marvelous joy. Although their faith takes a while just to settle, they can hardly believe that Jesus is alive. But he really is. His resurrection transforms his disciples. And what was true for the eleven on that day is true for us this morning. Because Jesus is alive and because we believe in him, our lives are likewise transformed in their entirety. Past, present, and future. That's our points this morning. Number one then, the real Jesus transforms our past. Listen to his first words here. Peace be unto you. Wonderful words considering the last few days. They had all pledged unswerving loyalty to Jesus. They had all failed him. Peter said in Mark 14 verse 31. If I have to die with you I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. In the garden of Gethsemane. They slept while Jesus prayed. And then when Judas comes in with the mob. We read again Mark 14 verse 50. They all forsook him and fled. And then there's Peter. He denied he even knew Jesus. Three times over in the courtyard of the high priest. And even now they're hiding away behind closed doors. Because they will not believe Jesus is risen. Even though he told them that several times before. And the women have told them. They profess so much. They can approve themselves to be cowards and backsliders. Peace to you. No rebuke. No words expressing disappointment. No harsh words. And he's here with them. He's not staying away. Jesus wants to be here. And he's come to them where they're at. And he knows their fears and he knows their weaknesses. He knows their failure. He knows their sin. But he's here. And he speaks peace. He makes peace. That's what he's done. Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. How can Jesus so freely pardon these disciples? How is it that he can come in and just bless them with peace? It's because he was delivered up for their offenses. It's because he was raised for their justification. So Paul can say in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, therefore, because he died, because he rose again, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So consider again your past few days. Maybe go back a little further as well. And consider your own backsliding. Your own disloyalty to the Saviour. But now come to him as he comes to you this morning. And hear his voice. Peace be unto you. He's the one who appears to us today. The one whose heart's desire is to be with his people. Have we failed him? Have we let him down? Have we been controlled by the fear of man? Hidden ourselves away from gospel opportunity? Are our sins like scarlet? His death and his resurrection makes us as white as snow. His death and his resurrection transforms our past. Because of Jesus, there is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. A glimpse of glory now revealed in meager part that drives all doubt away. I stand in Christ with sins forgiven. And because I am forgiven, I am now able to forgive others. 
Paul says in Colossians 3.13, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. You see, we all have a past this morning. Things that we're not proud of, words said, words not said. Things we've done or left undone. Attitudes that we've harbored. And we know they're not pleasing to the Lord. But because he lives, because he lives, our past is transformed, it's forgiven. It's something, yes, that we might struggle to take in, as did these disciples. They're terrified, they're doubting, they had failed. But Jesus, knowing all of that, comes to them. He stands in their midst, in his risen power. He wants to be with them. He wants to be with his people. He wants his people to know peace. Peace with God. And even peace with our past. All is forgiven. The real Jesus does that. Secondly, the real Jesus transforms our present. Verses 38 and 39, Jesus, knowing their fears, says, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit is not of flesh and bones, as you see I have. Now he's doing two things here. He's showing himself to his disciples as a real person and as the real saviour. He's not a ghost. He's a real physical man. The disciples are startled by his sudden appearing in the locked room. But Jesus moves to assure them that he's real. And that he's the same Jesus that they knew before. Behold me. It's me. It's I, myself. Handle me. And they did that. They did that. John begins his first letter, 1 John 1. With these words, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, that is Jesus. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full that's what's happened here that their joy is full in verse 41 so full that they can hardly believe what they're seeing they can hardly believe what they're handling he is the word of life he is the source of eternal life and he's there with them and he's having fellowship with them he's eating with them they have fellowship with the son of god Jesus, he, he sees that they're still struggling you know, to comprehend with what they're, what they're seeing, what they're feeling. He asks them for something to eat. And so they give him what they have, some broiled fish or some honeycomb, and he eats it in their presence. Again, he fellowships, those fellowships with them. But Jesus is saying, I, I'm real. Trust your eyes. It's really me. Trust your hands. Trust your ears. It's really me. He would later speak to John in the book of Revelation. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. He's the living one. And he's the living saviour. Jesus, you know, gets specific in verse 40. He showed them his hands and his feet. He is not just the Christ now. He is Christ crucified. And he is Christ crucified forever. Even when we saw him in in heaven in Revelation 5 verse 6, the marks are still visible. It says there, And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Jesus has went through it all. He was despised and rejected. He was 
bullied, he was lied about, he was accused, he was maligned, he was disgraced, he was let down by friends, he was abandoned, his own family didn't believe in him, he suffered, he really was the man of sorrows, smitten of God and afflicted, and he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And it's the same Jesus that here appears, and knowing what Christ has suffered for us, that that transforms our present. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Have we present day sins and griefs? Have we trials and temptations? Do we have trouble anywhere? Are we weak and heavy laden? Do your friends despise, forsake you? Come to the Saviour come to the throne of grace for help because he knows our every weakness he is the one who will gladly take us up in his arms and shield us and then him in Christ crucified we find solace he was present with his disciples in their hour of greatest need and he promises to never leave us or forsake us verse 38 there it's, it's the voice of Jesus that we need to hear when we are hard pressed when we are facing despair we need to hear it as it is here from the lips of Christ crucified why are you troubled why do doubts arise in your hearts behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself this Jesus that we need to hear it's this Jesus we need to handle and for that reason you know we need to be here in church to meet him we need to meet him in our Bibles every day we need to be living our lives in the knowledge that Christ is, is with us knowing that we live with the real risen Christ crucified that transforms our present day when we live with him then we will also preach him to the world around us as Paul said we preach Christ crucified and then thirdly the real Jesus transforms our future Uh, death is not the only future that awaits us Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and I'm going to quote quite a bit from it just in this last point if you want to turn it up in your Bibles 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Are you in Christ this morning? Are you a Christian? Are you in him? Then you will rise again. And you will rise again physically. Yes, at death, our souls and our bodies, they are are parted. Our souls, they are immediately in the presence of Christ. Our last breath here in this life is the beginning of that life of bliss in heaven itself. And as the confession says, our bodies, still being united to Christ, do rest in their graves until the resurrection at the last day. And that resurrection at the last day is guaranteed by Christ's own resurrection. He was really raised physically and transformed physically. Still recognizable, but glorified. Able to disappear from the house in Emmaus. Able to appear in this room here in Jerusalem. And those things, they might sound you know, make believe. But 
we have these eyewitness accounts in our Bibles, in the New Testament. It's guaranteed. All in Christ shall be made alive. And as Paul writes that, he knows that, you know, that, that teaching will meet with objections. 1 Corinthians 15.35 But some will, someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Paul has seen the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus and he is confident of the resurrection for every believer. And what he does here is he likens the death of the Christian to a seed being sown in the ground. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 37. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Just as there's a relationship between the seed and then the plant, so too there is a relationship between our bodies that rest in the grave and the new body that Christ will give us in the resurrection. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So he says. You see, sin and Satan will have no victory whatsoever over Christ's people. It may not seem that way when we stand at the graveside of a loved one. But because Jesus is raised, so too will all his children be raised. We don't just bury the body of a loved one. We sow. We sow their corruptible body in the certain knowledge that it will be raised incorruptible. Paul goes on to say in verse 52 that at the second coming of Jesus, at the last trumpet, they'll be raised in the twinkling of an eye. In verse 53, they must put on incorruption. They must put on immortality. Why? Because Christ is raised. And it's all because he is raised and raised according to the scriptures. And then Paul quotes from Hosea of all books. Now we've seen the unstoppable love of God in that book in the evenings of late. We haven't yet come to Hosea 13 verse 14. Where God says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Our eternal future is secure. Body and soul, all because Christ is raised. All thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it's not just our eternal future that is so transformed. So too is our immediate future. Our tomorrows are transformed according to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Therefore, my beloved children, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Would you want that? That tomorrow you'll be described in this way. Beloved, steadfast, immovable. Now, maybe you woke up this morning and that's exactly how you felt, but maybe not. I think if we're being honest with ourselves, there are many mornings we wake up and as we consider, you know, the day that lies before us and the different things that, that we face, you know, maybe we don't think. I am loved by the Son of God. I am steadfast in Christ. I am immovable because Jesus is alive and he is with me. You see, we so need to keep our eyes on Jesus. 
on the risen Christ crucified. He's the one who comes to his failing disciples and he speaks peace to them. Their past is transformed, they're forgiven. He's the one who says, Behold my hands and my feet, I am your saviour. I died for you, I am risen for you, and I am with you today. Your present is transformed. He is the one who always wants us. Amazing. He always wants us. He he wants you, believer. And he wants you to know that he's real. He wants you to touch him. He wants you to handle him. Yes, he wants you that close to him. And he wants you forever. Jesus said it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Despite our feelings of the past, our doubts in the present and our fears for the future we have a risen saviour who speaks peace to all of his children a risen saviour who loves us with an everlasting hope Amen let's pray please Lord God in heaven how we bless you for Jesus Thank you, Lord, for the absence of a rebuke. We thank you, Lord, for his presence with his people. We thank you that he is Christ crucified and alive forevermore. Please help us to keep our eyes on him. Lord, we're we're just far too easily distracted. We pray for grace that we would see and know and handle the same Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen.